Hello, I'm Scruffy, and today I've had the immense honor of collaborating with renowned video game composer Austin Wintory, who you may know from his soundtrack work on that game company's titles like Journey and Flow, Stoic Studios' The Banner Saga series, and Pode from Henchman and Goon. Before I say anything, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to contribute a word or two to this video because, spoiler, having watched most of this already, I'm floored and speechless by the depth of your analysis and yet the succinct and easy way that you present it. So let me just say thank you, and I, I'm grateful to be contributing. Together, he and I prepared this dive into his soundtrack for Giant Squid's gorgeous exploration game, Abzu. The game is all about witnessing the majestic beauty and sheer size and scope of the ocean, from the reefs and kelp forests to deeper ocean banks and abysses, all through an increasingly mystical and abstract narrative told without words. Abzu is an experience, and this video will give away the ending, so I highly recommend you play it, or at least witness it, before we get into what makes this astounding soundtrack tick. There are many facets of this soundtrack to discuss, and as we go through them, we'll stick closer and closer to specific late-game chapters. One of the most prominent elements to define this soundtrack is the following sequence of notes. A, B-flat, D, E-flat, G, B-flat, D, E-natural. You can hear this sequence used to frame instrument parts, sometimes as a chord, and sometimes as a breaking wave of arpeggio. The sequence isn't in any particular key, it's focused more on intervals between the notes. The trough of the sequence has D to E-flat, a half-step, and the crest of the sequence has D to E natural, a whole step. Comparing these two sounds is a bit dissonant, but lining them up in an arpeggio gives them motion. That motion opens up, curls up, and settles when the arpeggio goes back down. Reminiscent of a water wave, it guides the rest of the soundtrack even if it's hidden between or under other harmonies. This can lead to polyharmonies, harmonies that simultaneously reference multiple keys or sources. A simple example is playing two unrelated chords together as a whole. Often this note sequence is juxtaposed next to other impressionistic harmonies that you wouldn't expect to relate. And because Austin composes a reverb, that is, because he specifies how long he wants blocks of sound to ring, both in the score and in mixing the final track, he blends together those juxtaposed parts to create polyharmonies. It makes sense illustrating the size of the ocean, huge distances and huge gradients of temperatures, currents, and marine life. That's a key goal of all of this soundtrack and this game, to convey sublimity. Something sublime is something with a dreamlike grandeur or monumental beauty, something that inspires admiration, awe, and even respectful fear. The ocean is sublime, wouldn't you say? Once you consider the scope and depth of it, it's both beautiful and arresting. And that's what Absu and its soundtrack are looking to convey, abstractly. The soundtrack even builds in orchestration as you venture deeper. In the shallower oceanic zones, you have lighter synth pads, harps, and a bit of choir voices, which I'll cover in more detail later. Some late romantic-style orchestral strings purvey the whole soundtrack, imbuing the gripping sort of emotion of a celebration, even an exaltation of nature. In later, deeper chapters, the music grows and diversifies even more to a full orchestra with harp ensemble, a very lyrical choir, and a manifold collection of synthesizers. It all blends harmonies and intensifies to convey a huge space and almost overwhelming emotion. Now, let's hear some input from the composer himself. Austin, was this orchestration always your conception for the soundtrack, or did you go through some prototypes first? At the beginning, I actually was convinced I was going to be able to pull this off with just the harp ensemble, choir, and solo oboe, and then maybe some sort of delicate electronics and things like that. I, I was going to try to set a rule for myself to not use the orchestra. But then as it got later and later, I started to really feel that the power and the majesty that an orchestra can bring would be a nice glue. Um, and by the end, of course, you can hear it essentially became an orchestral score. But there are very, very early drafts of to no water, as it was later known, that were just choir and oboe and the harp ensemble. And as for where those particular ideas came from within that, I don't really know what to attribute it to. I have always loved choir as both a communicator of text, of course, which opens up all kinds of interesting storytelling possibilities, but also I love choir because it can be simultaneously so many different emotions in a way that 
no other instrument family can be. You know, it can be intimate in a very human way. It can be epic in a very human way, and it can be very mystical or ethereal, but in a very human way. And there was something about that that just seemed right. On some level, these stop becoming intellectual choices, and I just do what seems to be right for the game. And then the ultimate arbiter of that would be someone like, in this case, Matt Nava, the creative director. I play it for him, and I just see if it speaks for itself. In this case, he really loved the direction of these colors, and so that's what we went with. But these musical colors never overwhelm. And to keep it from distracting from the gameplay experience, the music needs to be somewhat anchored and most of all succinct, similarly to what you can see and control. Austin believes in a melody to fill that role, a theme that can get through the sublimity to communicate with the player. There's a specific melody that you hear in such tracks as to know water. and Siriola Lalandi. Austin, was this the first piece you composed? The first piece that I composed for Abzu, as, as with many of my scores, was the main theme, what we now call To Know Water, but at the time was just poetically called Main Theme. Uh, very often I don't really know the titles of these things until a lot of reflection and usually the last possible second when I have to decide things for soundtrack albums. In selecting an instrument to play these melodies, Austin found Kristen Nagus and her channel Field of Reeds, on which she performed the cover of one of his compositions for Journey on oboe. That earned her a leading role in Abzu's soundtrack. And why not? The oboe is a leading instrument. The shape of its waveform can cut through an ocean of orchestral sound, which is one reason why it's the chosen instrument to tune everyone else in an orchestra. This may have been inspired by the late 19th century symbolist composer Claude Debussy, who in such works as La Mer and Nuage had the oboe cut above the rest of the orchestra to highlight a melody or stand out with a mysterious repeated gesture. As you play Abzu, it's hard not to notice Kristen's oboe when it communicates to you. It's sometimes melancholy, often pensive, but a welcome bearings in this tumbling ocean. Another effective means of passing information through this dramatic soundscape is rhythm, and it's used most effectively in Abzu soundtrack. Every piece has a rhythm, but some are slow enough or blended enough to sound arrhythmic. There are various portals in the game where you can enter a spirit world, and you give a bit of energy from within you to restore life to the ocean. This is a meditative point in the game, and there are even statues where you can literally meditate and watch the behaviors of individual sea creatures without a worry for time limits or missed paths. So the music in the first Spirit World portal, for instance, rings each sound long enough that its slow rhythm suggests relaxation and patience. Just about every instrument has some sort of digital effect to muffle it, distance it, or make it sound more otherworldly. And it repeats a very small passage of music, but at such a slow tempo that the rhythm is negligibly spurring our movement. There's no rush in this state. Once life returns to the world around the portal, the strings cathartically celebrate the return of vibrant color in marine life. There is a more noticeable rhythm here, but it remains slow, steady, and reflective. Think of these two as meditating in a truly timeless world versus meditating in the real world where time is passing. Makes sense that in the latter we would start to feel time moving. Rhythm communicates more when the player is specifically tasked with moving. The following theme is Myliobatis Aquila, which plays in an area of the game where a large green chain stands out from the orange foliage. In order to reach the next area, you need to follow this chain to two cranks that can open up the large door blocking your way. 
While this isn't an immense challenge, it does have you scouring the environment more than usual. So the music scores less of the environment around you, and more of the motivation within you to solve this problem. When you get the door open, the music seamlessly fades to a stripped-down, more cautious version of that same rhythm. How does it know when to switch to this version? Via Audio Middleware, a program that implements audio to adapt to the game world. In this case, WWISE. I've described adaptive audio and audio middleware in a previous video, but essentially it's audio tracks that play or change under certain game parameters and variables, such as the player character's location. Austin used audio middleware to tell the game, OK game, play these two versions of the track simultaneously, but mute the second one. When the player gets past this door, fade in the second one and fade out the first one, and then let the second one loop. This is how one large piece of the game can feel like one continuous movement of music without needing hours of music to account for possible hours of gameplay. And it leads to a very important concept for game music and sound designers, game rhythm. Game rhythm is the pacing of the game, how long it takes to complete puzzles, how backtracking feels, how much thinking time you are allotted, and how much patience you need. Abzu constructs sections of its game rather like movements in a classical piece. More contemplative parts give you all the time you need to absorb them, more narrative-driven parts encourage you along, and fast-paced moments carry you along and prevent you from turning back. And audio middleware makes these movements more seamless. For example, take Delphinus Delphus, the theme that plays when you encounter your first current and get carried along with a pod of dolphins. Now here's a good example of game rhythm influencing music. A faster rhythm overtakes this theme, more intense and audacious than before. The whole time you are locked in a current, and your forward momentum is constant except that you can briefly speed up by swimming through schools of fish. The piece is thus split up into sections with different melodies and elaborations of the note sequence we mentioned earlier. These sections score the swimming with almost film-like timing because audio middleware can account for hitting an invisible checkpoint and prepare a transition to the next section seamlessly. This is most noticeable at the end of the piece, where your speed builds and builds until you breach the ocean surface with your counterparts. That's a really effective arrival point, where the tension gets released, and it'd be so difficult to time it right when you have to keep in mind technical things like player input and frame rate, so audio middleware ensures that this musical rhythm always aligns with the game rhythm. Let's hear from Austin again. Can you describe what digital audio workstation you used and specify what the audio middleware does for the score? So I composed everything for Abzu in Digital Performer, but it goes through a little bit of a process to get to the finish line. All the sketches and mock-ups and things like that are created in DP, including placeholder, you know, electronically realized versions of things like the oboe solos, the choir, the harps. And I tried to recreate them pretty accurately. Like I had seven discrete mocked up harp parts panned correctly to their physical placement in the room as to how we'll be recording them, uh, all of that kind of thing. After creating all the mock-ups, we start recording instruments. For all the soloists, like the solo vocals, uh, and for Kristen, I would record those directly into Digital Performer. In Kristen's case specifically though, she lives in Florida and I live in California, so she would record uh, at home based on PDFs and things like that that I would send her and then just send me the audio or send me the audio for several different takes that I can edit and manipulate or, or whatever and uh, build directly into my session. So there were many cases where I would send to Giant Squid a mock-up of the orchestra but with the live oboe already incorporated into it. Then when it came time for the large-scale recordings like the full orchestra in Nashville and the uh, choir and harp ensemble in London, all of that is recorded in Pro Tools I then export all my electronics and Kristen's oboe parts and solo vocals and other elements, percussion, things like that, um, into Pro Tools as well, and it goes to my mixer, and he mixes it all there. I then, at that point, import things back into Digital Performer so I can line up all the final recordings precisely with my mock-up and deliver them into the game. Because at that point, everything has to go into WISE, where the sound designer Steve Green had done all the implementation and scripting of the music, and in order to be able to just swap out the mock-up for the live recording, uh, everything has to be precisely configured the same way. Every stem and layer, individual track, all have to be the same lengths and all of that kind of thing. Drawing from various inputs, or what we often call hooks, in the game, 
Wise is telling the score what to do and essentially sending back that audio to the game's engine, in this case, Unreal. And then we can get more complicated by saying things like, uh, after the player it crosses this line, um, add in additional percussion, but the oboe solo that you heard at the start should only be heard once and the underlying orchestra should continue to loop without it, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We develop all these rules for every single cue very specifically uh, as we go in a, in a kind of moment by moment way throughout the whole game. That's definitely a complex process, but the resulting flexibility makes it so worthwhile. From here on out, the game becomes a series of movements with unique color schemes and musical idiosyncrasies. Here's where I put a spoiler warning. I implore you to have seen and heard Avzu first. Okay? Okay. Our next movement involves swimming into an area so vast it's unclear where it ends. One prominent instrument in the Avzu soundtrack takes center stage here, the harp. Actually, seven harps, arranged in a wide stereo formation. Harps have been, historically, pretty great at conveying the motion of water, and Austin effectively uses the harp's lower end to convey the depth of water as well. Now, I'd like to talk to you about when you hear the seven harp ensembles start glissandi all at the same time. They sound out of any particular rhythm, and that's because they are directed as such. This is an aleatoric gesture, meaning that although Austin is conducting this ensemble, he's leaving the rhythm of these glissandi up to chance. It's at the performer's discretion how fast to play. Austin's only direction is to repeat out of time until the next instruction occurs. You hear this effect again at the moment when I feel the game's narrative really sets in, when you meet a school of whales in this immense oceanic zone and swim with them. Aleatory is another way to make music sound like it's being played by the ocean, in which a normally discernible harp becomes a wash of color. The instrument with a lot of bite to its attack becomes a gentle texture. After a cinematic dance with whales that is essentially scored like a film, we descend to the seafloor amid the stranger side of marine life, and we get a taste of danger with these unwelcome triangular pyramidal mines floating around the area, shocking the diver if she comes near. There's actually no music here. Instead, the soundscape takes over. It's important to let this new threat stand out as obvious, so it scores the scene, beeping higher and faster when the diver approaches. The only other sounds filling this scene are a quiet drone and the rumble of water pressure. Down that deep in the ocean, you no longer have any companions, not the whales or dolphins or robots. It's just you and the turn the story is about to take. Actually, Austin, is this abyss section truly devoid of music, or did you compose the drone here? So the abyss section of the game is essentially devoid of music, although I did compose the kind of pulsing and throbbing drones. There's more there in the game than on the actual album, because a little of that, I think, tends to go a long way, especially in an otherwise mostly orchestral score. But I, I worked a lot with the sound designer Steve Green to make sure that my drones were kind of dovetailing in and out of his ambiences and the, the sort of quirky and, and uh, creepy mechanical noises. On that subject of collaborating with Steve Green, we worked very closely together on every single moment of the game. And it was really fun because I, I got to help hire him, actually. He was fresh out of school and Giant Squid were building their team and said, let's build a sound design test. And I'll never forget his because we said, be creative. This is a game that we don't want to just hear bubbles and kind of the low rumble of underwater ambiences and distant whale calls and all that sort of thing. A thousand different sound designers could do that. So hit us with something interesting. And Steve sent back the sound of, you know, oceanic gurgling and whatnot. And then there was kind of this break and there were sort of reverberant footsteps. And he didn't know anything about the game. In fact, even Giant Squid were still so early that they didn't know most of what would be in the final game. But just the imagination of thinking, well, it's an underwater game, but what if you're somehow able to walk and it sounds like you're in a deep canyon or something, or in a big hollow basketball court where there's, you're the only one in there or something like that, just, just to play with the ear. And so we started working together and Abzu was literally his first game and it was a joy for me and working subsequently on, on, on multiple projects since then has, has been great and his career really has begun to flourish. And, Part of what made me feel very confident in Steve was 
his eagerness to experiment and to really push the bounds of what we could achieve for the score. It's very important to me that at all times, the true north of music in the game is its storytelling potential. It was never about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we just do this or that? It became about, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if the player experiences this drone or experiences this big swell in the orchestra and then we reveal the whale and the melody breaks through? How do we make sure that we can control that happening? And that's the kind of partner I, I, I dream of. Felt very lucky, especially for someone who had literally no prior professional experience. That's excellent to hear you found such compatible storytelling in Steve's sound design. Let's hear what happens when you take it one step further into the abyss. With two electrical generators you get running, you are able to continue to the next area. This area contrasts from all others before and after. It's a giant mechanical pyramid, mirroring and chock full of the electrical pyramid mines you encountered earlier. Inside, you find how it's been manufacturing the robot companions and mines constantly, and has been supplied by the same power you've been giving off to bring life back to the ocean. This is the farthest point in the hero's journey circle of the game, the shadow, the other, the furthest from home, where the protagonist must grapple with their external and internal struggles. Thus, the soundtrack sounds almost as far from its character as it can be. Firstly, it's largely synthesized in this chapter, and any organic sounds we hear, such as solo vocals and oboe, are filtered with some dissonant effects. For example, over this vocal line, we hear an echo that in each successive echo is tuned up 43 cents at a time. Here is the effect isolated on the choir. The same sort of filter tunes down the oboe as it echoes, slowly corrupting and washing away the sound of both instruments. Underneath them is a pulsating, distorted synth, the heart of chaos. And any other acoustic sounds in this chapter are swathed in a radio filter, distancing them from their natural sound. A similar effect is used in the music of the spirit world, but not with this degree of dissonance. There is a spiritual element to this chapter, after all. It's the protagonist starting to come to terms with this antagonistic force showing her its true nature, and, spoiler alert, extracting the life of the great white shark she has followed who her civilization appeared to worship, and who seemed intent on dispatching this pyramid by itself. Both you and the shark sink below even these depths, and everything fades to black. The specific effects applied in Chaos the Mother, when you're kind of in the dark night of the soul, as it were, within the game, is a fair bit of distortion and reverse reverbs and things like that. And uh, even some very kind of old school synth techniques like ring modulation. I, I tried to make the signal still very recognizably, the English horn and uh, the voice, the, the amazing soprano Ayana Haviv, but yet feel corrupted, feel broken. You should have an instant connection to the source sound in a way that's not obscuring where it came from. And yet you can clearly hear that it's been busted in some way or another. I also like doing that because there's something that feels sort of biomechanical about very rustic, old-fashioned analog synth manipulation techniques on acoustic instruments, as opposed to a synth sound that's built electronically from the ground up. The corruption through electronics of an organic acoustic sound feels biomechanical, and that's to me very much how the underworld of these pyramids felt. Coming back from this archetypal abyss, we learn new information. Our diver is a robot, powered by the energy the pyramid craves. She comes across the sunken ruins of her civilization, and it is here that the diver must spiritually replenish herself and find a way to stop that machine that fatally injured the Great White. This area has our diver walking on land for the first time and meditating among quite a few species that have long been extinct in real life. If the past areas were surreal for combining disparate fish species, this place is sur surreal for juxtaposing a city, trees, and a shore deep under the ocean with prehistoric creatures. So the music certainly undergoes some changes. We hear some angular woodwind parts for exploring this strange landscape by water and on foot. 
we hear more integrated electronic parts in reference to the diver's true nature and atonement. Mainly, it's this bass synth instrument that plays wandering progressions of fifths. We hear a panning tremolo on the string section at times, ascending it above the romantic sound of the ocean to the surreal sound of the city. But amid these new sounds are still the aforementioned nuances that glue this whole soundtrack together. Clear oboe gestures, blending harmonies into polytonality, aleatoric harps, and rhythm based on the activity of a scene. For instance, this chapter does have its own rapid current containing some ichthyosaurus communis, and the moment you enter the jet stream, a triumphantly driving tune named after the fish begins. This one champions polyrhythm, something else Austin sneaks into his soundtracks. Polyrhythm has multiple rhythms played at the same time, even if they're based on different subdivisions of the beat. This tune mainly plays with eighth notes or sixteenth notes mixed with quarter note or eighth note triplets. At the end of this current, the music calms to a crawl, and you find a final portal to the spirit world. Before we go there, though, Austin, do you mind talking about your inspiration for this whole part of the soundtrack? There was a lot of new material that showed up. Once we open up into the kind of sub-oceanic civilization, what Genova Chen, the creative director at that game company, referred to as Atlantis, which made me laugh because it made me think, how, how did I never think to call it that? I wanted the score to feel decidedly different, but also the same. If you look at a score like Journey, which in many ways is kind of the um, spiritual father figure or mother figure to this score, it's very dogmatically monothematic. There's a single theme that rules over every single note of the score. I wanted it to be so much about this soul journeyer. Abzu, I thought I could try a little differently. There is one theme at its heart, and that is the, the theme that I think is emblematic of the diver. However, there are constant forays into sort of incidental material. In many respects, I was thinking about the Rite of Spring and how it's this giant through composed, non-thematic piece. There are sort of recurring orchestral gestures, but there isn't anything that we might call a theme that truly comes back in a structural way. And I thought as a challenge, I wondered if I could create a score that has a similar sort of through composed way and creates little pockets or little islands as you go where material is developed and explored and then set aside. So if you notice each major biome of the game's narrative has its own kind of proprietary material. The main theme then becomes this like lantern in the dark that helps see you through all of these disparate places. So when we get to this big abandoned civilization, the idea was, okay, now I need something truly new. The electronics start doing a kind of walking bass type figure that is new to their voice. And it's a new sound, a new actual timbre that is not really found elsewhere in the score. I also take other elements and sort of push them to the sides, like some of the more ringing bells and things like that. I, I, I use them a lot less. I also loved this uh, notion of the dancing sort of parallel clarinets. There was something that felt very whimsical about that and fresh and new. I wasn't really using the clarinets in, in a featured way up to that point in the score. Again, just to keep it familiar and yet fresh. Everything was about exploring ways to keep this palette consistent and not just pulling out something arbitrarily new and yet giving it a fresh take or a fresh spin. Well now, let's bring up something monumental to keeping this palette consistent, something that has played a prominent role across the soundtrack, especially in the spirit world. It's the choir. The choral ensemble in this soundtrack is the London Voices. Their harmonies grace us whenever our protagonist, and by extension her spirit, comprise the focal point. Most notably, the choir echoes through every instance of the spirit world with different loops of soft, swaying polyharmonies that change slow enough to suspend game rhythm. Voice is a very personal and intimate sound to us, even if for most of the game these voices are filtered to sound almost through a radio.
But once you are restored by this orb of energy, and once your spirit manifests as this pivotal great white shark, you can hear the London voices unfiltered, unfettered, and exultant as you dive into an otherworldly plane of existence. Listen to this cluster chord aligned perfectly with the dive. The lyrics here are from the first tablet of the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. I'll read you a translation. When in the height heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Abzu, who begat them, and Chaos, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together, and no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen, when of the gods none had been called into being, and none bore a name, and no destinies were ordained, then were created the gods in the midst of heaven. This excerpt conveys a time before anything was created, when only Absu, the god of fresh water and life, and Tiamat, the goddess of salt water and chaos, existed. The creation of other deities all started with these two mingling their waters. A powerful message to convey in the game, this setting of the text celebrates a time before any destinies were conceived, when water was just mingling with water, life mingling with chaos, the ocean being the ocean. That's your goal, as you destroy the pyramids in this ethereal realm, and the music brings together everything we've talked about in full orchestra to champion your efforts. It has a triumphant rhythm to it that advances between transitional sections and lyrical sections only when the audio middleware detects you're moving along in the world. Harps flourish throughout the piece, sometimes upholding a rhythm, sometimes with aleatory to add richness. The pitch sequence we mentioned before makes a bold return in one transition. And amid all this excitement, amid all these melodic lines, the theme of Abzu returns several times, sometimes in strings, and sometimes in the choir themselves. it now has a clear harmonic progression under it. And where does it lead? You enter a representation of the giant pyramid from earlier, only this time you're able to satisfyingly plow through the mines that posed a threat before. In leading up to your final collision with the core of this pyramid, an ostinato begins an oboe and builds to include the whole orchestra, eventually giving up rhythm to let each instrument aleatorically build tension for this moment. Take a listen. And thus, the core is destroyed. The final opponent to the ocean is neutralized, growing kelp, coral, and life all around it. After this comes the credits, with you and your great white shark reunited and swimming about this new hub of marine life. As the credits roll, we hear the London voices in a complete, direct, and new a cappella setting of the Enuma Elish. Less laudatory, more contemplative, this track is called Then Were Created the Gods in the Midst of Heaven. 
Almost in the role of a Greek chorus, this piece reflects on the events of Absu and on the nature of our diver and her spiritual connection to this shark. It comes from the same harmonic language Austin used for the rest of the game, and it brings back the same main theme. But it certainly has a different character from everything else we've heard, and that's a fine approach. The previous piece was where we wrapped up the soundscape of this game into a climactic arrival point. This one is the breath we take afterwards, and it's not necessarily a breath of total resolution, but it does close the curtain on a majestic experience. As I mentioned before, Abzu and its soundtrack go for sublimity, a feeling of splendor beyond the scope of our everyday lives, something so vast and dense, graceful and daunting, that we as storytellers need myths and surreal depictions to characterize it. This game is a beautiful, surreal love letter to the sublime ocean, and whether it inspires you to explore the ocean for real, or apprehends you with its sense of scale, it would not be complete without Austin's soundtrack. For me, the choir was representative of the Abzu, the kind of ethereal or otherworldly force. If a lot of the electronics are supposed to be the kind of bad guys, as it were, the precursor civilization or the just the big pyramids or whatever you want to label them as. And, and to be clear, there isn't really a canon, an unwritten backstory. It was, in, it was meant to be sort of impressionistic and allegorical. I thought of the oboe as representative of the diver and the choir and the harps both being tied to the abzu itself, the kind of glowing blue, heavier than water liquid that uh, you find in the game that is kind of the, the life giver. The choir is becoming more and more revealed the more life that you spread and the text that serves as the spiritual jumping off point for the whole game becomes increasingly also revealed. That, that was all done deliberately. Of course, this was not something I just knew out of the gate. The idea was developed over the th three years that we worked on it. I got more and more of these as we went and then refined and kind of worked it out so that the architecture of the score overall really came together. As a side note, I'm insanely grateful to have that amount of time to uh, work on a game like this because I don't ever land on a large scale structural idea from the beginning. It's always something that's iterated into and then you start to see it for what it can be and you move around pieces and you shuffle parts so that it really comes together. It's really not unlike, I think, composing an opera in that sense. Even though I haven't yet composed an opera, it feels like it would be very similar. With that, a major thank you to Austin Wintory and his assistant Dallas for help with the script and for the gameplay footage. And before I go, I'd like to posit a question to Austin about his next project with Giant Squid, The Pathless. Austin, is your latest soundtrack trying to be sublime as well? In what ways will the mood, the setting, and the pace of this new game alter your approach? What have you learned or can you take from Abzu? For his answer, head over to his YouTube channel with the link in the description. I'm Scruffy, and thank you very much for diving in. If you'll indulge one final comment, I just want to say again how honored I am that you have made a video of this depth and of this clarity. I feel very, very grateful to be part of it. And also, I just feel redoubled in my gratitude for having been a part of Abzu. It was an honor enough to work with Matt as the art director on Journey. He and I were such profound mutual admirers and so much about his art and my music were co-inspired perhaps. Uh, during that game that that alone would have been a, a career highlight but for him to then go off and make his own company and for their first title to be something as beautiful and poetic as Abzu and to invite me to be part of it is something that I've felt grateful for for the last six seven years more than I could say but watching your rough draft of this video I was so overcome with emotion in remembrance of how grateful I am and I just felt compelled to make sure that you knew how much you reminded me of how grateful I am about all of this. So thank you again for including me, and thank you again to Matt and to Giant Squid and to 505 Games for collectively uh, believing in, in me and believing in this game and for having the commitment to pull it off. It was a very stressful experience, I know, for the team. It was not an easy game to make, and I thought they did an incredibly beautiful job, and I can't believe how lucky I am to have been a part of it. Thank you again.
Thank you.